All right, so as we begin today's event, I want to start uh, with our university land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beothic. And we'd also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatiavut and Nunatuavut and the Inuit of Nitasanan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the people of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. So Al Jones is no stranger to Newfoundland and Labrador folks um, and to Memorial University here. She's uh, visited several times before. She's a poet, journalist, professor and abolitionist living in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She was the fifth poet, poet laureate in Halifax and a 2015 resident of the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa. Elle was the poet in residence at U of T Scarborough in 2021. She won two Atlantic Journalism Gold Awards in 2018 and 2019. In 2016, she was a recipient of the Burnley Rocky Jones Human Rights Award for her work with prisoners. She was the 15th Nancy's Chair in Women's Studies at Mount St. Vincent University. She received her PhD in Cultural Studies at Queen's University and is an assistant professor in the Department of Political and Canadian Studies at Mount St. Vincent University. So I want to welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us. And as I mentioned before, please post any questions that you have, any comments or questions you have in the chat uh, throughout this workshop, and Elle will keep track of those along the way. Please make sure you have uh, stuff to write with and stuff to write on, however you see that. Um, so Elle, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Yesterday, I was talking to my publisher. We were going through the um, like marketing sheet, and they were like, what about book festivals? Are there any book festivals you like? And I can't think of anything. I was like, I like Newfoundland. <laughs> and that's the only thing I came up with. I like to go to Newfoundland. I really do like going to Newfoundland. So thank you, everybody. I wish I was here in person, but it's really beautiful to be with you here this morning. Um, I am in Jibuktuk. Halifax on the unceded and unsurrendered land of the Mi'kmaq people and the Wolostuk people. Um, and it is also, of course, Black History Month. So this is the place where liberated African people um, made their homes and have been for hundreds of years in so-called Canada. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm going to move pretty fast today just because I want us to get through stuff, but I don't want you to feel pressure around writing. Um, if an exercise is going too fast and you want to sort of stay back on a piece that's okay right like I just don't want you especially the first exercise we're going to do has a like a bit of timing just to keep time short and sometimes that can put pressure on people and people feel anxiety but I want you to just let that go no matter how much writing you do today that's the amount of writing you're supposed to do so if you miss part of an exercise or you just aren't feeling it that's okay make this space your own so that's the first thing let's just let go of the kind of pressures we put on ourselves around, is this good enough? Is this enough? Am I doing this right? And let's just make this space into a space where you give yourself permission to write or to not write or to express and say however you want. Um, so there's no right or wrong way to do this. I tend to talk and say poems because I generally write poems, um, but you can write things out in paragraph form as well. So just because I'm calling it a poem, doesn't mean it has to be a poem as you write it out. Feel free to write in whatever form you want. So uh, I'll probably keep saying in your poem, in your poem, but it may not be a poem for you. Um, very, very quickly uh, to introduce myself, as we mentioned, I am a poet, a writer. I also do some journalism. I'm what we now call nonfiction, what I call essays, I do as well. Um, I also have the experience of doing academic writing. So for some of you that may be coming from the university and are here because you feel that you haven't been able to tap into or you've lost that creative space, I 100% understand that. And I hope that you do find places to express yourself if you're doing academic work at this time. But of course you don't have to be, I'm just saying I understand that struggle as well. Um, very quickly, what I'll say is I mentioned this already, many people talk about having writer's block um, you know, not knowing what to write. I firmly believe that it's not that we don't know what to write. It's that we find it hard to give ourselves permission to say the things we want to say or say them in the way they need to be said. And I think often when we block ourselves, either there's something that's, you know, almost like something's in our throat so we can't let our words get past it 
because we're not saying the thing that we needed to say. Um, I do this, I've written for years and I still do the thing where I'm looking at two lines on the page and I'm like, these are terrible. I don't know what to do. I erase them, I take them out. So I think it's usually a good idea for our writing to, to try and get rid of that and just to let the words come out. You can always fix them later, right? They don't have to be perfect coming out. If you have nothing coming out, you don't have anything to work with. And it's usually better than you think. So as I said, give yourself permission to just say what you want to say. Um, don't worry about whether it's good or bad. Um, I don't really believe, especially in the context of spoken word, you're lucky if you're doing spoken word here today, like if you want to do spoken word, because I don't really believe in like good or bad poetry. When I was in grad school, they would always tell us, um, oh, you know, good poetry, good writing is writing that like sustains itself over time. And it's like yields to multiple readings. And I'm like, yeah, my poem about like, you know, you tearing down the school in the corner does not yield to multiple readings. Like it's pretty clear <laughs> it is about tearing the school down on the corner. Um, so some of these ideas of, of what is good writing, um, you know, what is effective writing, um, I think a lot of times those can just stifle us from saying things that we want to say. And particularly if we're writing for social justice, um, that is also about writing in reflection with ourselves. Um, one of the hardest things in writing, I think, is pushing forward, like having that kind of faith that your voice will come through at the end. Um, and when you're looking at that blank page, I think there's a lot of internal battling that goes on with yourself. And I've come to believe that a lot of writing is about having that self battle. It's not about your you know, technique or how many images you use or, you know, those things help. Obviously having a sense of language helps. Um, if you can hear your voice, that helps. If you do a lot of reading, like that helps, you know, all these things help. But I've come to think that the main thing is being able to confront yourself as you write and being able to push through your doubt, um, being able to push through your sense of other people are better than me at this. This isn't good as other things I've written. This just isn't working, you know, that sense of frustration. So I think it's a lot about building that faith in yourself and building that kind of stability inside yourself that you can draw on when you're writing. Because there's a, so much doubt in writing. When I was at BAMP um, doing my book, you know, you're with all writers. And it's like, I always laugh because you come at like lunch and half the table would be depressed, you know, and the other half would be like, yeah, it's going well. I actually wrote like, you know, like a 50, 500 words this morning. I'm feeling good, you know, and half would be like, nothing's happening. Like, this is terrible. Then you come at dinner, it'd be like reversed. And the half that was happy at lunch was like, it's going terribly. Everything collapsed, you know, and the half that was like doing terribly at lunch was now happy. And so you really got a sense of that real up and down that happens with writing, right? That one day you feel good about it. You go to bed, you're like, oh, this is great. And then you look at it the next day and you're like, this is horrible. What was I thinking? Like, I can't write, let me delete it all. So that kind of emotional state, um, I think just like in activism, just like in other things in life, you have to have a resilience built up inside you. And I think that writing can actually be part of that process of building up your own capacities of reflection and resilience that then not only for the writing, but then you can take into movements, into your organizing as well. Because I think so much in organizing, we have to have a very strong sense of ourselves, an ability to look into ourselves, an ability to be humble, an ability to deal with doubt. All of those things, which I think we can nurture and work on through writing, then come into the spaces where we're taking action. And I don't see a large gap between action and writing. In fact, I would suggest that perhaps writing for social justice, if I had to describe it in one way, I might say it's trying to bridge that gap between theory and action, between what we write and what we do, and trying not to make them completely different worlds that one is you know, living in the mind and the other one we don't know what to do. How do we give ourselves as uh, Audre Lorde tells us, how do we transform our silence into action? So that's my introductory piece. And now I'm going to stop talking and make you write. So <laughs> we're jumping right into it. So I hope you have paper or something. My hair's in my face. Um, the first exercise we're going to do is based on a simple idea that I believe that poems are lists. Writing in general, I think, is often lists. So if you can make a list, you can make a poem. Um, you know, if you can follow something through and have things in a sequence, I feel like that's all writing's really doing. I often picture writing as a map, right? That you're trying to get from this point to this point. Often when I'm starting writing, I don't have a lot of language ideas. I usually have almost like an essay, like, okay, I want to say that we're not living in freedom yet. I want to mention this. I want to mention that. I might, that might be all I know. And somehow I have to map my way to get through those points. Um, and often you're really sort of listing different kind of signposts. So poems are lists. We're gonna start with some lists. If everybody has their paper out, 
Um, I said, this one is timed. Like I'm going to be like, stop, start. Don't let that get on your nerves. It's not a huge deal. If you're still writing or something, do as you will. As I said, draw your own boundaries. Um, that's important in writing, I think. All right, it's weird because I, I can't see you. So I feel like I'm talking to myself. I'm sorry if I'm talking fast. I know I'm a fast talker. And then when I don't see anyone on screen, it's like I talk to myself and get even faster. So I apologize. Um, all right, so if you can get out your paper, whatever you're writing on, um, this is just the first list. I just want you to think you're in a place that causes you joy or peace, a place where you, that you love. Just describe what that place is, like what you would see and hear. This can be single words. It doesn't have to be like full sentences. So if it's the ocean, you would just be like the waves crashing, the, the sand, the, the sun, right? Like whatever it is. So just you're in a place that you love, describe what's around you. And I'm going to give you like a minute and a half. Okay, 30 more seconds. Okay, just draw a line, start, just start finishing off whatever you were doing and just draw a line on, on under it, like just separate it out so you can see it. The second list is going to be, um, what is beauty to you? So that can be ideas, it can be describing things that are beautiful, um, whatever comes to mind, what is beauty to you? This wind is a lot, <laughs> 30 seconds. Actually, I lied, I'm gonna give you another 15 on that just in case. Okay, start winding that up and you know, draw a line. The next one on a similar theme, what is strength to you? So again, that could be images of strength. It could be people who you think are strong. It could be why you are strong if you want. What is strength?
Okay, 30 seconds on that. Okay, uh, start winding that up. Just draw a line. This one, uh, hopefully not too triggering in the times we're in, but let's reclaim this word. What is freedom to you? What does freedom mean? What is true freedom? Thirty seconds. Oh my goodness, the tree is outside my window. Oh my God. If my power goes out, I'll come back on my phone. Hopefully, yours stays up. So if I suddenly, you know, go dark, it's probably that my internet went off, and I'll come back on my data. But sorry to talk. Sorry, keep writing. All right, start uh, winding that up. Hopefully, me talking at you didn't interrupt that too much. Last one, um, what is care and safety to you? What do care and safety mean to you? It could be images again of things that are safe. It can be actions. It can be people who are caring. Thirty seconds. Okay, start to finish that. All right, so this is a bit hard because we're not in person. So I'll try and describe this as best as I can. So with the list that you have, I picked evocative words and phrases. Obviously, 90 seconds isn't enough time to have you know, a complete philosophical encounter with the concept of freedom. So part of this is you're thinking quickly, which is also part of perhaps busting through the writing barriers, right? Like you're just coming up. What I'm gonna say is that you can take this list and make it into a poem. You should have a series of words that mean something to you. So simply by adding I am to the front of most of those words, you could probably pick up a really good poem to start with. So like, I am the waves crashing on the shore. I am the mountain that stands strong. I am, right? Like, so choosing the words that you have, you might also use phrases like I come from, 
or um, I have overcome or I am strong like. So just by adding in your little phrases, but let's say just do I am, you should be able to make a nice poem that is looking at some of the words and concepts and ideas that came from you. They're integral to who you are. So I'm gonna give you like five minutes. Sorry, I know these timelines seem really short. We'll try five and you can hand, put up hands when you're done. And if people aren't done, I'll give you more time. So just by using phrases like I am, choose, you can pick ones you like. You can expand on some of the concepts if you like and make it into a little poem, um, like a short poem. Uh, you could pick one thing that you really like, that you really liked when you were talking about your grandmother's strength and, and expand into that if you want. So there's no wrong way to pick. You can pick everything and just be like, I am and, and do go through the list or you can choose different areas, but take what you have and by adding like I am or maybe another kind of prompt, make it into a poem. Does that make sense? Hands, if it's, if I'm making sense, I would normally kind of demonstrate this to you, but I can't. Okay, perfect. Okay, so that's, um, it's, yeah. So it could take like five minutes, perfect. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read Ottawa Twitter while I wait so that I'm not staring in your faces. But if you want to message me and ask me something, feel free to also use the personal chat. Um, you can add in descriptors as well. So if you put strength and you put a mountain, if you want to add in your own description of the mountain to change it up, you can do that too.
If you have about two more minutes, is that too little, too much? Hands up if you need more time than a couple of minutes. I don't want to rush you like to the point where you can't write. Okay, so let's try a couple of, let's go till five after, and then hopefully that's enough time. Oh, somebody said, oh, but you don't have to be poetic. Like poetic metaphor. I use like one image every year. So don't, you don't have to worry about poetic metaphor. It can be, it will be, it can be very powerful in stark language. Like don't stress your writing to do what you don't want to do. Like if you've ever heard me perform, when have you heard me use an image? <laughs> I, you know what I mean? I, um, so, so just, uh, you know, you can just literally choose the words. You don't even have to, to do an image at all. <laughs> I don't believe in good poetry. I believe in strong expression. But that's a good, I just want to, I do want to make that point. Like don't ever, you don't, don't press your writing to do something else than what your writing likes to do. Um, you know, like you always have to write in the voice that you can claim, especially by the way, if it's spoken, because nothing's worse than having to stand up and actually, like on a page, you can kind of just hand something and you're like, mm, you know, when you're saying it, you have to say it, right? So you have to own it and you have to hold it. So if it's not a voice you like, it's really uncomfortable. So do what your voice likes, do what makes sense to you. Don't do something that doesn't work for your voice. <laughs> oh you're making me laugh this is literally how I do poetry by the way I'm like oh that word sucks use it <laughs> it'll be fine no one will notice that's literally how I do poetry so you're probably on my vibe true story one time I, I forgot a poem midway so I pretended I was crying I was like, I'm really overcome. And then everyone was like, oh, that was so powerful. Because normally, um, you know, you're so composed on stage. So it was really nice to see you be emotional. But it was really that I had just forgotten the poem. And I was like, I need a minute. My friend was like, wily veteran move. So there you go. Um, you can always cover anything up live. It's fine. Nobody, people only hear 20% of, of what you're saying anyway. It'll be okay. All right. Um, does anybody need more time? Okay, so I don't know, normally we'd be reading things to each other at this point, if you want, um, but I don't know how fast you type, like I'd love to see things in the chat, even if it's not a full piece, like if there's a bit you like, or you, you just did a hotline. Um, the point of this exercise is, so please share if you want to, like start typing into the chat, I would love to kind of see what you did. Um, the reason why I like this exercise is I feel that it reminds us that like, you can just kind of go ahead with writing. It's a very fast exercise. I find lists very useful in terms of like in poems, they very much work orally. Um, when, as people are listening, like listing is one of the most tried and true oral techniques. You'll find it through the Bible, like anything that was you know supposed to be read out loud. Um, and especially if you're doing it in an activist context, it's very easy to do a poem where you just like list all the shit the premier did to unions or whatever, right? Like it's quite effective. So it also can really free us up for writing. So in this list, I just gave you words. I gave you, you know, places that you like. It can be like music. I change it up all the time when I'm doing this exercise. And what it's supposed to kind of show you is that the, these things already live in you. Um, you know, like ideas of places, ideas of images, ideas of words, they're already there. And it's just meant to pull that out of you and perhaps demystify some of the process of writing as well. I am toes on cold floor, out of bed. I am huddled puddle, back to bed. I love that. Uh, <laughs> that's me every day. Why am I even awake? Why is this happening right now? I love that. That's great. I love huddled puddle too. That's that's amazing. That was great. So yeah, if people want to put stuff in the chat, 
And so I just see this as a bit of a freeing exercise for writing. Um, obviously, if you're doing it, if I want to shift it to like political writing, um, yeah, I, like I said, I'm often doing a poem that's just like listing shit that the government didn't do for us in COVID, you know, like, and then you just kind of fence it up with some lines, but more or less, you'll be sort of saying the bus drivers that had to drive on buses without vaccines, the janitors who got uh, COVID because they had to clean and the migrant workers who remain unseen, right? Like that's all a spoken word poem is, like just to freestyle one at you. And it's, I'm telling you, it's just lists. So hopefully that's helpful. If you want to put things in the chat, go ahead. I'm gonna keep moving. I hope that I'm not talking and going too fast and being annoying. Like I said, it's kind of like I'm on stage giving a workshop to myself. So I can't quite gauge timing for you. Um, so I hope I'm not rushing you and please feel free to say we need more time or something. As you know, time feels a lot longer when you're not, hang on, it's not showing me the thing I wanna share. So just let me, okay, why? Why are you being like this? Okay, sorry, Zoom is just having a moment with me. I'm trying to share something with you. Okay, here it is. All right, given what is happening in Ottawa right now, where I, you know, and now the police crackdown is happening, uh, we're hearing a lot about rights. So I thought it was a good day to reapproach the idea of rights, not as individual rights, but as something that is part of something bigger. Normally I'd make someone else read this, but I guess I will read it. I don't know how many people know June Jordan's work, um, but this is a poem about my rights. So even though June Jordan wasn't technically a spoken word artist, by the way, a lot of the work she does very much fits into the genesis, like the, the timeline, the ancestry of what somebody like me would be doing. So I'll just read this to you. I'm, and then I'm gonna make you do your own version. So taking the title, you can take out some of the ideas, whatever you want. Um, so this is a poem about my rights. Even tonight, and I need to take a walk and clear my head about this poem, about why I can't go out without changing my clothes, my shoes, my body posture, my gender identity, my age, my status as a woman alone in the evening, alone on the streets, alone not being the point, the point being that I can't do what I want to do with my own body because I am the wrong sex, the wrong age, the wrong skin, and suppose it was not here in the city, but down on the beach or far into the woods, and I wanted to go there by myself thinking about God or thinking about children or thinking about the world, all of it disclosed by the stars and the silence. I could not go, and I could not think, and I could not stay there alone as I need to be alone because I can't do what I want to do with my own body and who the hell set things up like this. And in France, they say, if the guy penetrates but does not ejaculate, then he did not rape me. And if after stabbing him, if after screams, if after begging the bastard, and even if after smashing a hammer to his head, if even after that, if he and his buddies fuck me after that, then I consented and there was no rape because finally you understand. Finally, they fucked me over because I was wrong. I was wrong again to be me. Being me where I was wrong to be who I am, which is exactly like South Africa, penetrating into Namibia, penetrating into Angola. And does that mean I, I and does that mean I mean, how do you know if Pretoria ejaculates? What will the evidence look like? The proof of the monster jackboot ejaculation on Blackland? And if after Namibia, and if after Angola, and if after Zimbabwe, and if after all of my kinsmen and women resist, even to self-immolation of the villages, and if after that we lose, nevertheless, what will the big boys say? Will they claim my consent? Do you follow me? We are the wrong people of the wrong skin on the wrong continent. And what in the hell is everybody being reasonable about? And according to the Times this week, back in 1966, the CIA decided that they had this problem. And the problem was a man named Nkrumah. So they killed him. And before that, it was Patrice Lumumba. And before that, it was my father on the campus of my Ivy League school. And my father afraid to walk into the cafeteria because he said he was wrong. The wrong age, the wrong skin, the wrong gender identity. And he was paying my tuition. And before that, it was my father saying I was wrong, saying that I should have been a boy because he wanted one, a boy, and that I should have been lighter skinned, and that I should have had straighter hair, and that I should not be so boy crazy, but instead I should just be one, a boy. 
And before that, it was my mother pleading plastic surgery for my nose and braces for my teeth and telling me to let the books loose, to let them loose. In other words, I am very familiar with the problems of the CIA and the problems of South Africa and the problems of Exxon Corporation and the problems of white America in general and the problems of the teachers and the preachers and the FBI and the social workers and my particular mom and dad. I am very familiar with the problems because the problems turn out to be me. I am the history of rape. I am the history of the rejection of who I am. I am the history of the terrorized incarceration of myself. I am the history of battery, assault, and limitless armies against whatever I want to do with my mind and my body and my soul. And whether it's about walking out at night or whether it's about the love that I feel or whether it's about the sanctity of my vagina or the sanctity of my national boundaries or the sanctity of my leaders or the sanctity of each and every desire that I know from my personal and idiosyncratic and indisputably single and singular heart, I have been raped because I have been wrong the wrong sex, the wrong age, the wrong skin, the wrong nose, the wrong hair, the wrong need, the wrong dream, the wrong geographic, the wrong sartorial. I, I have been the meaning of rape. I have been the problem everyone seeks to eliminate by forced penetration with or without the evidence of slime. And But let this be unmistakable. This poem is not consent. I do not consent to my mother, to my father, to the teachers, to the FBI, to South Africa, to Bedford Stuyvesant, to Park Avenue, to American Airlines, to the hard on idlers on the corners, to the sneaky creeps in cars. I am not wrong. Wrong is not my name. My name is my own, my own, my own. And I can't tell you who the hell set things up like this. But I can tell you that from now on, my resistance, my simple and daily and nightly self-determination may very well cost you your life. So that is an extremely powerful poem. Um, normally, I'd ask you what you think about it. So if you want to type that into the chat, just feelings or ideas that came up. Um, of course, in the beginning, she's really framing based on all these male poems about, you know, like, uh, walking in the woods alone at night, contemplating the stars. And she's pointing out that as a woman writer, as a black woman, she can't do that. You can't just go outside and walk around and go live in the woods and do all these things because you're always constrained. And then of course she takes that image of the body and moves it into politics. Um, you see what I mean about listing, right? So you see how powerful this poem is because it's based on making these connections through these repetitions, through listing. So when she says, you know, my body, my vagina, Namibia, South Africa, and she puts these words together in these lists, it's incredibly powerful. So you see what I mean about what an effective technique that is? Um, but yeah, so what I wanted you to do, um, I can keep up the screen, but obviously you can't see the whole thing. So if you wanna pull this up yourself, you can see it's from the Poetry Foundation poem about my rights, June Jordan. Um, actually, I'm not gonna keep it on screen. Uh, so hopefully if you want to reference it, you can look it up yourself. So I want you to do your own version of it. Now that may just mean taking the title. I've done this with women in prison where we just take the title poem about my rights and they often write about like the rights that they don't have in prison. Or you can take some of the ideas, a line of it, adapt it into your own, do what you want with this. And I know some people sometimes are like, I feel uncomfortable adapting a black woman's words. Like if I'm not a black woman um, in this circumstance, we're not appropriating her words. We're not claiming them as her own. We're recognizing the power of her words and using them to guide our own. So that is a difference between, you know, taking her words without honor and without care. We're going to do this in a caring way. So don't feel that you can't um, use this. Obviously think carefully about you know, if you're not a, a woman um, or a femme identified person, you know, how you come into these words is going to be different than if you're a woman or, or femme presenting, right? That would be a bit different. So do think carefully about what it means to um, take these, these words into yourself. But um, yes, let's not, don't, don't feel like, oh, I can't have June Jordan in this moment because I am not a black woman. Um, yes, thank you for the link in the chat. So if people want to click on that, so you don't have to do um, a one-to-one, -one. like you don't have to like rework it. You can just take an idea that resonated with you as you heard it and do it by yourself. Does that make sense? Hands, if that made sense. There's no wrong way is what I'm telling you. Um, it could be taking one line. It could be taking the beginning. Do take, feel how it resonates for you 
And the reason why I particularly wanted to do this poem in this moment is exactly because we are seeing this conversation about individual rights trumping all collective rights, um, this appropriation of freedom into white supremacy, which it always has been, right? Freedom for white conservatives, no freedom for the rest of us. Policing, fine for you, not for me. I just spend an outraged minute because the local right-wing tabloid who has literally stalked me and followed me around and threatened me for years is now somehow against the truckers, which I don't understand because they're like literal convoys uh, people, but now they're like doxing people on the right. It's so strange. And, I, and they're talking about journalists being threatened. I'm like, like you threatened me? But of course it doesn't matter because I'm a black woman and I don't deserve freedom. Uh, when I speak about things, I'm automatically opening myself up for violence and then they can do the exact thing, same things I do, right? So just an example of how, so like freedom in a white supremacist settler colonial country has always only belonged to the convoy types and never belonged to us. And June Jordan in this poem so powerfully speaks about that and reminds us of that. And that's why I like this poem in this moment. It should stoke our rage, but it's also a poem that has a lot of love in it too. I'll stop talking. Okay, so I'm gonna give you till half past. Does that make, oh, sorry, half past my time, sorry. Um, 10 minutes from, 10 minutes from now, what are we in Newfoundland? Uh, that would be to the hour for you. I feel like CBC. All right, does that make sense? 10 minutes-ish. Go ahead. And I'm gonna look at your pieces. Oh, these are beautiful, Sheridan, I am a child's face. That's lovely. That's a beautiful line that evokes so much. Oh, Sheridan. Oh, Sheridan, that's lovely. That's a perfect poem. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I love the most moss on stunted trees and age face nature's not, that's beautiful. Cheryl. Oh, these are, this, that's beautiful, Cheryl. Lifted up by the child's out the wind off the lake I breathe, I like that. I come from bread. Oh, that's lovely.
poem. I'm so happy. Cheryl Armistead, your poem is beautiful. I love that too. Oh, Shannon, I love that. A poem is a list, a place of the A and B and C that I want to say, and I can say A and B and C, and the poem says yes, yes, yes. I love that. I love that idea of the poem saying yes. Beautiful. These are great. See how? See how easy it is if you just let go all this other stuff around writing? Wish I could take my own advice whenever I sit down to write. I am a space filled, unfilled, right and wrong, here and there. I am a space bar, tap, 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 while in between thoughts, time passed, passed, time done and undone. I am a space cadet, paralytic times of brain dogs, minutes turned to hours, to days, to weeks. February, what have you done? Is that is that diatra? Is that how you say that? I love that. And I really like how the poem kind of fell into the space that you started with space and then the space kind of almost imploded as the poem went on. So then a space cadet, paralytic times of brain dogs, like it was almost like you started with the space and then the space like expanded through your poem. That was great. I really like February, what have you done?
Uh-oh, my lights just flickered. Hopefully we get through the next half hour. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, I, no, I can go on my phone. It's okay. You'll just have a short break and then you'll see me in the dark on my phone with data. But I have all these lights around me right now and they're like definitely flickering. Um, <laughs> So start finishing up. I'm going to talk to you a little bit while you're doing that. Um, and also you can keep these exercises over. I'm not giving you a ton of time, so you might be really into what you're writing and please feel free to finish that. Um, I'll put my email in the chat. And if people want to send me your work, please feel free to do so. Sorry, I just have to put everyone. Uh, my email is. So I find it really, hopefully I wrote that right. Okay. Yeah, I find that. I mean, first of all, when you step into somebody else's work, says pause and think about how other people use language and the kind of ethical responsibilities we have to have to language. And that's obviously part of social justice writing, right? Um, we have to be careful, right? That often you're writing about very violent things, triggering things, you're writing about issues. And of course, there are people, I always say that, you know, when we fight a human rights case, there's somebody human rights who are being violated at the center of that. And we cannot forget that, right? Um, I do a lot of writing about prisons. I always send that work, read it to people who are in prison because I am not in prison. That doesn't mean I can't write about it, but I have a responsibility to do it in a way that um, speaks to those who are inside, that shares with them, that doesn't take over their voices, right? Um, so when you start thinking about how somebody else is using language, I think it's a reminder of that ethical content. How do we approach language? How do we think about words? How do we choose what we're doing and, and navigate that landscape? Um, I also just, in general, poets, we're part of a heritage, right? Writers are part, and especially in social justice, we're part of an ancestry and a lineage. Um, there's often stuff that nobody else will know I'm referencing in a poem, but I know I'm referencing it because the way the language resonates with me and kind of becomes part of me and comes out in my own words. So I actually think there's something beautiful about um, knowing the other works that are around you and the ways that we, they, they live in us and become part of us and come out in our own work. And then the other thing I like about this in general um, that I think is interesting about when you go into somebody else's poem is that, um, yeah, I mean, it, it just, it, it places you in it. I don't know. I, I don't know what I was going to say there, but I, I don't know if you want to write in the chat just what your what you did. If I know there's a lot of typing. If you want to type out kind of your approach, if there's a line you like or there's something you want to share, please do use the chat for that. Or even like what it kind of felt like. Like what pieces were you choosing out when you looked at this poem? Did, were you taking the idea of rights? Were you taking the idea of the body? Like which parts of it kind of resonated that you were reconstructing in your own work? And maybe like how did you go about that? Like did did you take her words and just adjust them? Did you take the idea and feeling and, and just put it in your own words? I'm sort of interested in that. So if you want to, normally we'd be having this in conversation. So these are also maybe things just to think about on your own. Um, but yeah, I think when we look at, you know, a poem like this, that is so personal and so filled with like the rage that we're often scared to capture. That's one thing that I like about this poem a lot, how unapologetic and clear she is about the rage for everything in the world and how it all connects. And she's not compromising on that rage. She's like, yeah, I'm gonna be mad today about not taking a walk and about rape and about what's happening in politics is all connected. And I'm gonna say it right here in that last line, like my, my coming into myself may cost you your life because when I start asserting myself, it's, you know, like I just love how willingly angry she is in that poem, which is something that I am consistently shamed for, for example, in my poetry. Are you ever positive? Um, but as Audre Lorde, who we're going to look at next, talks about, our anger is a clarifying force, right? Um, she has an essay called The Uses of Anger that is very much about actually discovering our anger as a social justice force. And particularly for women and femme-coded people, although not only, not 
solely, but we know that there's particular narratives around being seen as angry. If you're a person of color, right? Anger is always the number one invalidating thing. So I think it's politically important for us to also pick up that anger, be in touch with that anger, not have pushed it down, not feel that we have to engage in civility performances or respectability politics, that we actually tap into that place that is righteous and that makes these connections. And we're not afraid to do that. And yeah, somebody's gonna be like, oh, why are you so mad all the time? Because, because Namibia and South Africa and Pretoria and my body and my mother and dad, that's why I'm mad all the time, right? Um, focus, that's nice. Okay, yeah. So. And you see how much is there, there is in this poem that all of the, it gives to all these people, all of you in a different way. So um, writing about beauty and your problems with your body, medical traumas, intersex person. Oh yeah, that's, see, I mean, that's, see, these are lovely adaptations and so important, right? Um, so thank you. I would love to read these. I know if you may not want to share them in the chat with everybody, if you feel comfortable sharing, I would love to see them at some point. Um, Holly, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, that's really profound. And Sarah as well, thank you. Can I read this? It's in the chat. Sitting in the waiting room, my body is a black box like the state. My body, my business, my problem. The scale sinks into the soft pads of my feet, pressing, peering, surveying. I am not a mystery. My body is a greenhouse and your mind is the black box. That is fantastic. And what I really love is you picked up in the poem how she makes that connection between rape and the state. And then because you're talking about the medical trauma and the literal policing and surveying and controlling of sex and gender and identity through the body, you, you, you crystallize that into that poem. And, and like, it's actually not even a theoretical connection. It's actually real in the medicalizing of my own body. That's fantastic. That is, is extremely powerful, uh, Robert. I stand on the shorelines watching waves crash inward. What are the rocks learning? How is the land changing? We stand on the sidelines seeing waves ripple outward. Why do these winds cut cold deep in our bones? What are our children, families, communities learning from the winds and waves? What are we learning about why and how we live here together? Beautiful. And I really like shorelines and sidelines. And I don't know if you're referencing Audre Lorde for those of us who stand on the shorelines, um, but you know, that's a very powerful reference that I see in that poem. So there's, if people don't know the poem I'm talking about, Audre Lorde has a very famous poem for those who, of us who stand on the shorelines. I forget the actual title, that's the first line. Um, so I also see that in your poem, Robert, Robert. but I really like the um, moving to like, what are we learning from the land and why and how we live here together and making that, that's beautiful. These are all wonderful. So everything I've seen here in the chat today is, is so, good it's so centered it's so clear and so as you see everybody can write everybody has everyone has the right to write everyone has the permission to write and everyone can do it uh vicky i'm going to read yours i know my rights mean responsibility two sides of the same tarnished coin thrown so casually about into fountains lost from pockets dropped into guitar cases hoarded into piles protected in banks shielded from sight the currency of rights speaks to those whose ability to pay increases exponentially as does the rhetoric. Plastic, fantastic, computer chipped, metallic strip. Ooh, that's good. You can make a donation to the cause. There will be no refunds. I really like, I mean, I said an ooh when I read the plastic, fantastic, computer chip, metal strip. That's great. But I also really like that move again from like the coins into the currency of rights. These are so good. Everybody's good. Okay, I'm going to stop praising you and go to the last thing that I wanted to do. I keep talking about Ordre Lord, so we're going to do uh, look at one Ordre today. If you don't know who Ordre Lord, Lord is, she's my favorite writer. I mentioned her already on Transforming Silence into Action. She speaks to us a lot about um, the importance of speaking and our fears of speaking. So she tells us that um, if we do not speak our words, they will come out anyway and punch us in the mouth on the way out. Um, she got cancer at the, at the end of her life, and she believed that it, a lot of it was the toxicity of having swallowed her words for so long, the stress of that. And so she speaks to us so much about how to make our words take place in this world. So if you haven't read Audre Lorde, read Audre Lorde, but I'm going to share this poem by her. So she was a Black lesbian mother, warrior, activist, poet, writer, and everything in Audre Lorde is true. <laughs> like, if 
she lives with me and moves with me throughout my world. Um, as, you know, the older I get, the more that she's saying is true. Every time things happen, I'm like, oh, Audrey, talk to me about this. So this poem is called Power. You know where we're going with this. You're going to be writing a poem on power. So, you know, you're, you're catching the vibe now. But here we go. The difference between poetry and rhetoric is being ready to kill yourself instead of your children. I am trapped on a desert of raw gunshot wounds and a dead child dragging his shattered black face off the edge of my sleep. Blood from his punctured cheeks and shoulders is the only liquid for miles. And my stomach churns at the imagined taste while my mouth splits into dry lips without loyalty or reason. Thirsting for the wetness of his blood as it sinks into the whiteness of the desert where I am lost without imagery or magic trying to make power out of hatred and destruction, trying to heal my dying son with kisses. Only the sun will bleach his bones quicker. A policeman who shot down a 10 year old in Queens stood over the boy with his cop shoes in childish blood and a voice said, die you little motherfucker. And there are tapes to prove it. At his trial, this policeman said in his own defense, I didn't notice the size nor nothing else, only the color. And there are tapes to prove that too. Today, that 37 year old white man with 13 years of police forcing was set free by 11 white men who said they were satisfied justice had been done and one black woman who said they convinced me, meaning they had dragged her four foot 10 inch black woman's frame over the hot coals of four centuries of white male approval until she let go the first real power she ever had and lined her own womb with cement to make a graveyard for our children. I have not been able to touch the destruction within me. But unless I learn to use the difference between poetry and rhetoric, my power too will run corrupt as poisonous mold or lie limp and useless as an unconnected wire. And one day I will take my teenage plug and connect it to the nearest socket, raping an 85 year old white woman who is somebody's mother. And as I beat her senseless and set a torch to her head bed, a Greek chorus will be singing in three, four time, poor thing. She never heard a soul. What beasts they are. That's from the 70s, by the way. Um, those last lines are like, so, like, I don't know that anyone would even try to articulate those last lines in this day and age. I don't know that th those are almost unspeakable, I think. Um, but she's getting to this monstrosity, to the, the, the monstrosity of rage and like being so, it, in connection with it, right? And the, the, the section about the jury, she gave up the, the la first real power she ever had. It, it's such, yeah, it's exactly, it's just a brilliant poem. I can't even begin to get into it every time I read it. Um, it, it you know, it, it just comes at something inside you. So you're gonna do your own version. Now there's a lot in this poem that's quite obviously, I mean, it, it's a poem dealing with violence. You don't have to encounter that violence in your own work. That might be very triggering for you. You can just take the idea of power as well. Um, so if you just wanna almost just take the title, that's okay. Um, the poem obviously takes us to some very deliberately like painful and dark and, and uh, disturbing places that you may not in the last 15 minutes really want to go into. So I, I ask you, I tell you to draw your boundaries around how you go into this poem, um, but do with it as you feel. And I'm gonna give you 10 minutes for that and then we'll have five minutes at the end to sort of debrief. Does that make sense? So until, ten, uh, sorry, uh, I, can't, I can't do math, 10 minutes, whatever that is from now. And Cheryl, I'm looking at your poem. I am nurse, drawn into the collie, neither willing nor unwilling, a matter of circumstance. Ooh. I uh, lost it, there you go. A matter of, of circumstance and the men who determined for recuperating child what could or go would be in higher education, so not a doctor, but a nurse. And the only response to my parents was you don't have the resilience, but we'll give you bus fare. Oh, that's a great line. Socialized and indoctrinated, curious, fascinated, questioning, but not yet, not really out loud because that's not how it works. Girls and I was but a child, do as they're told and are visibly invisible, but I understand duty and so it continues and I shine everywhere. I grow to love the smell of urgency, of life and near life, of machines and scalpels, of the intimacy of shared stories when the karma returns as we put the person back together before turning to the next. 
I am humble as I physically prop the mother straining with incredible pain and her forces and most times we celebrate. And when we don't, we wrap the souls and weep to ourselves. That was then. Oh, Cheryl, that is fantastic. I really like that socialize and indoctrinate, curate, fascinating, questioning, but not yet. That's a really great series of lines. Sorry, I have to like lean into the screen that my face is all like huge. Uh, Shannon, I wrote in a way that was inspired by sense of contrast. Yes, I have to think through. Yes, a poem is a list of places. I can't find a, I can find a poem with place, place to place with poem. I need to have written a black alley full of snow. I have shelter everywhere. That's a beautiful line. You guys are so good. I, I suck at last lines. You guys are all good at them. I always just keep going and I'm like, stop. And then I'm always trying to stop. That's great. I really like I have shelter everywhere. That's a beautiful line. My only urgency now is to not have to care. That burns my soul and is the skin that conceals my inner shame and just maybe release. Ooh. That's fantastic. This video is gonna be mad boring on YouTube. Eh? It'll just be like me staring into space or like leaning in to read for like long periods of time. I pity anyone who watches it. You have to just clip out the exercises. <laughs>
I'm going to read Robert's poem. You have the power to be resilient. Everything happens for a reason. You can survive anything. We've done it for generations. But don't waste too long talking about changing or poking the roots of why we're made, forced into resiliency as strategy. Don't you know Indigenous rights are so last season? Ooh, see, what I like about that poem is it looked like it was going one way and then it went with a gut punch at the end. Um, and what you're getting into there is, is, yeah, that like these narratives of survival that are often almost to justify a state of oppression, right? Like, oh, but you're so strong. It's like, but we shouldn't have to be, you know? I admire you, you know, you've been through so much. Well, yes, you chose to inflict it on me, right? Um, so you're really encountering that and I really like that. Um, but yeah, like that, that's, that switch from what seems like affirmations into talking about um, how this is actually the way to not by, by like, oh, I'm firming like your strength and I'm not actually going to do anything to undermine the causes of why you were forced to be strong. That's awesome. I really like that. That's a really important statement. And the way the poem is set up, like, so that last line just comes in and just gets you. That's great. A couple of more minutes of writing just to, does anybody need more time? I just always feel like I'm stressing you out. Like, <laughs> If you're in person, it would be a calmer space. It's harder online. All right, I'm gonna read uh, Robbins. Feelings of power and oppression are so triggering. The wheel of fortune is so fickle. Do others spin their own wheel and why not me? It's not privilege I want, it's reality. It is true that all are equal and valuable and free. So why is it not reality? Will I never not be a stranger? That's a great one. Will I never not be a stranger? Searching for a bridge between what is true and what is real? Maybe, maybe not. I like that. I really like um, the questions and I like, it's not privilege I want, it's reality. It's true that all are equal and valuable and free. So why is that not reality? A question I always ask, um, like in terms of this is so simple, it's basic social policy. I like that. Um, but I really liked how the questions um, like were posed in the poem. And then I really liked um, the difference between some of the um, like, that like you have a sort of, I don't want to call them prosaic questions, but like, why is that not reality? And then you have this poetic line, will I never not be a stranger? So I like that switch in tone. Um, so it makes that line really stand out as well. And then that, and you think, okay, why is this person a stranger? Stranger to whom? To themselves, to society. So it's, it's nicely done there. That's very evocative. Uh, we have about five, well, okay, seven minutes. This goes very fast. Um, I don't know if people, if we maybe we could take the chance to maybe unmute and cameras on for the last few minutes, does that work? Just so I can kind of see as I don't know, uh, Sonia, if that's a possibility, we, or if like it's a thing. <laughs> like I'm, in the, I'm just gonna see what I can do. Okay. In my just to kind of debrief for the there last. Minute. I've oh. asked all to unmute. Um, you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, this is, you said you recorded this. So yeah. for people who don't want to be on a recording, don't unmute. I just mean, if you want the chance to. Um, so so I've, also, I've also allowed people to start their video, so. Perfect, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, this went very fast, obviously. In real life, we don't, probably don't write like three poems in a row, like, but I hope what it shows is that, you know, there's so many places to begin writing from, from a word, from a concept. There's so many ways to just go into it. And the most important thing I always want people to get is that your writing is there for you. I think we're so alienated from our writing um, in so many ways that we feel like we can't do it. It's not there, it's not right, it's not dropping. I don't have the time, it's been taken from me. So I hope that when you sort of come together and you do exercises very quickly, my hope is it sparks that idea that you actually can, that in 10 minutes you actually can do this beautiful work that I'm seeing in the chat. Um, so why not keep that going? You know, why not make it and perform it? Why not um, do it at the rally? Like it's there for you, you have it in you. So I always think that's the most important thing with writing. I just think we're so alienated so often from those pieces of ourselves that we put so much in place to not write. And when we get through that, we find that we have so much to say. So um, I don't know if people want to comment or say anything. I just want to give you a little space to debrief. How did that feel for you? Was it easy or was it hard? Or like, did you, did it work for you? I'm also still looking at poems in the chat. Sam, I'm looking at yours. 
No man should have all that power. I'm not backing down and my sister has my back. I love that. You better fuck off, dude, and face the fury of the pack. Oh, what? You thought you had all the power. You had the wealth and you had the tower. Watch out, fucker. Your power turns sour. Your tower is crumbling and our pack is getting stronger. Can you hear our growl? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like that too. All these are great. And what I love is the different tones, the different places, how people take the same material and, and live in it in different ways. Um, so I just wanted to give you a chance. How did that feel for people? Did it work? We, did you feel like you felt empowered to write? Okay, yeah. And then for the social justice piece, it's just like, we have shit to say, say it, you know? Like, um, I don't know how to, I feel that clarity in writing for social justice in terms of having your own clarity around your voice and your own clarity about where it can be placed is the most important thing. I think writing is the least of things to a certain extent. I always say this, I think it's just stepping into your voice, stepping into your power, being assertive about what you want to say, getting rid of the, those fears of like, what will people say at me? And like claiming your words in just really strong ways. The two poems I showed you today are people that don't give a fuck. Like they're like, I can talk about killing, being so bad I wanna kill people in a poem. Like I'm gonna talk about electrocuting an 85 year old white woman in my rage in a poem because I am not checking your politics around this. I'm talking about what I need to talk, right? So these very, very powerful expressions. Why is Ottawa calling me? That's not good. Um, so, uh, okay, good. Rights, power, challenging to write about, really freeing as well. Good. Felt safe, even though we're being extremely vulnerable. Yeah, good. Um, so some things, if you want to keep writing, some people do things like morning pages, like they just try and carve out 10 minutes and just write anything. I can't say I do that. I'm very a material writer. <laughs> I like write when I have to. <laughs> I'm like, oh God, I have to write this thing for something tonight. Like, like I'm, I'm just not going to lie to you. I'm not like actually a very free writer. Like I'm, I'm kind of a like have to do it writer. But once I'm writing, I, I do a lot of like yeah, I mean, as I said, I map, I list, I just kind of let it flow. But in the end, if you're claiming your words and it means something to you, it will mean something to other people. Um, especially if you're thinking of performing it, like what matters in a performance is commitment to your own words, the sense that you own your words, the sense that you own yourself and that you're standing in it. And that's what people are mostly left with. People don't I've had people attribute poems to me that aren't even my poems. You know, like people don't remember what you said. Like, they're like, oh, don't you have a poem about your grandmother being a maid? Like, that's like all they remember. You know, people don't really remember. They remember the sense, the feeling, the commitment, the sense of sincerity. They remember stuff about the poem. And especially in a space where, you know, if you're, you want to write about something that means something to you, like about a movement or it's for a rally or it's part of a, someone's doing a publication on poems about the environment or whatever it is. Um, I think I always think it's more important to have that space you've stepped fully into what you're saying and embraced it. Um, so that's it for me, I guess we're at time. Sonia, I don't know if- Yes, absolutely. I was going to uh, jump in at this point anyway to say thank you for this workshop. Um, and also your point that you made just earlier, your writing is there for you. And I think that that, um, I hope that everybody got that sense that your writing is there for you from just the exercises that you had people do right from the start and brought us through through this whole hour and a half. So thank you so much uh, for being there for us and also in a space that is not as conducive. I think you spoke <laughs> the word poetry. You want to be in a space together where everybody is sharing the same, the same molecules of air, but uh, we are virtually sharing those molecules of air. Um, I also want to thank all of you for coming today and for sharing your words and your writing with everyone, which I thought was fantastic as well. Uh, if people are interested in other Nexus Center events, I'll mention that on our Twitter, on our Twitter and our Facebook page, our Twitter is at Nexus Center. Um, that's where things will be posted. Uh, we do have an upcoming talk on yoga and white public space, uh, which is co-hosted with the Research Center for the Study of Music, Media, and Place, uh, and the Department of Gender Studies. It's a scholar named Rumia Pucha from the University of Georgia, uh, Women's Studies there, and it's on March 9th. So that's one event coming up. Um, but thank you so much, Elle, and thank you, all of you. Uh, we will be putting this up on our YouTube page when it's ready to go. So if you wanted to revisit any of the exercises or you wanted to have a sense and revisit what some of your, um, what some of everybody shared in this particular and that Elle read out for us. Uh, that Sometimes was I was reading soft because you were writing, so I was trying not to read like too loud. So when yeah. I was reading the soft ones, it was because I was like, oh, no, yeah. let me not interrupt so, me too much. So. 
Thank you so much. And uh, I will wish you all a fantastic weekend. And I hope we all get through the storm and all the wind relatively well. Thank you for joining us today. Take care. And thank you. It takes a lot of courage to write in public. It takes a lot of courage to um, yeah do this in front of people. So um, that in itself, I think, is a really important act. So I really honor everybody for taking this time to write, taking the space to do it for yourself, those who shared, those who didn't share. And I always appreciate the boundary you're not sharing too, right? When you're like not getting coerced into sharing something just because other people are. So that's really important. So thank you, everybody. Have a beautiful day. Thank you so much. You have my email in the chat if anyone wants to get in contact or show me work or anything. And I'm going to let you go, but take care now. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye.